Uh, maybe you're a doctor, I'm not sure. Table 25, Valerie, if you could just say your surname as well. Good, good morning, panel. Uh, my name is Valerie Gein from the National Business oh. Initiative. Um, I'm just wanting to ask a question of the panel. We spoke, and I think the program director alluded to the relationship between energy and the economy. So my question to the Department of Energy is what are the Department of Energy's plans to support energy efficiency in the private sector in particular as one way of addressing energy security? Okay. It's a core uh, issue for the Department of uh, Energy. The issue of uh, energy efficiency. There's a program that has uh, started with a number of uh, government uh, departments and buildings to refit them with uh, globes and other utilities to make them more energy sufficient. So in partnership with uh, other departments like the Department of Trade and Industry, and other sister departments, uh, also uh, public enterprises and others. It's an area that uh, government is engaged in. And synergies, partnerships with uh, the private sector are welcome as to how best to mitigate our utilization of energy. Okay. Um, table number uh, 31, Lifad is there, uh, Maki Bianyane. Uh, table 31. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, my name is Lefadi Makibinyan. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Consulting Engineers South Africa, CISA. Uh, my question um, is uh, quite a, a simple one. I want to find out from the Minister the support. I, I heard him highlighting uh, some of the inter government uh, approaches, especially towards uh, local government. Local government, we know that mo most municipalities or some of the municipalities have got power stations that have really aged and that need some serious refurbishment and turn around so that uh, you know, energy can still be uh, uh, generated at the local government level uh, for the sake of uh, not only security of supply but uh, for jobs that uh, must be retained because uh, uh, there have been jobs in those particular power stations and the, at the moment they are running I idle uh, there is a lack of productivity by the staff employed in those particular municipal, uh, uh, you know, plants. Mm -hmm. And the other question that I want to just pose is the PBMR. If the minister can just uh, tell us, I mean, there, I hear the drive towards nuclear uh, energy, but South Africa spent uh, quite a lot of money. I think nine billion rand was blown into the development of the PBM, PBMR. Uh, that uh, I think the nation was never really informed of why it became. Uh, the mission aborted. If you can just get some highlight on that. We cannot talk about this type of things without really creating knowledge uh, locally. I think South Africa has been a pioneer of some innovative technologies in the past, Sasol being one of them, and uh, we cannot afford to follow uh, the world. We must lead where we can lead. Thank you. Okay, so nine billion rand, is that true? Uh, mission aborted? If I may, uh, mm. sir. Whenever somebody says, I'm going to ask a simple question, <laughs> I expect what the gentleman has just done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with regard to the equipment at local government level, it's an issue that we are looking at. We have visited a number of uh, provinces where there's been investment to bring small power stations up to speed. So there is a, a program of refurbishment. Uh, in regard to the figure mentioned with regard to the PBMR, I'm not certain about that figure. Mm. But I must say, from my previous responsibility as the Deputy Minister of Public Enterprises, it is not true that the public was not informed or given information about that program, and it's winding down. Why was it wound down? Excuse me? Why was it wound down? It was as a result of uh, 
at that time, the needs of the country, the intellectual property that we had, there were a multiplicity of factors that had to be considered. And the program was mothballed, which means that the intellectual uh, capacity that we had, the intellectual um, know-how that we had, we still have lots of that. And that will stand us in good stead as we move forward with the nuclear build program. So There's a difference between retaining what you have in order to utilize it at a more opportune opportunity. It's different from discarding what you have and selling whatever you have. So we need to be truthful in engaging the public with regard to information. Okay. Uh, Carl Stain, Table 23. Uh, Carl Stain. Morning, panelists, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Carl Stein from the Southern African Association for Energy Efficiency. Um, when considering that one unit of energy being saved on operational level, 10 times more energy can be saved at generation level. If that is the case, it, energy efficiency can replace generation quite easily and more cost effectively. Why do we not see many more energy efficiency programs being launched in this country? Thank you. Okay. We did say earlier that uh, energy efficiency is valuable and it's a vehicle that we are exploring and utilizing. But energy efficiency on its own will not carry this country. That's a fact. So we can torture figures mm -hmm. in order to get to particular outcomes. But the responsibility that we have as a country is to use all the energy carriers that we have to an optimal level. To be irresponsible to say that you've got coal, you are going to uh, not utilize the natural resource that we have as a country. It would be irresponsible to not utilize the solar power that we have, the programs that we are rolling out throughout the country, Eastern Cape, Western Cape, Northern Cape, as well as Limpopo. They are all okay. those uh, carriers. It's a responsibility that we have to utilize them. Um, Ms. Baleni, one question I have for you here is, that's coming through uh, again on Twitter. Net metering will reduce municipal income. It's all about revenue protection, not about creating for consumers. I don't know if two of you can... <laughs> yeah. Well, if I may, yeah. th th that's why the whole you know, approach is to try and find a balance between mm. those two, you know, what is good for the country mm. and, you know, uh, how do you sustain municipalities. It definitely would mm. impact the uh, municipal revenues, but that's not the only mm. consideration at play. Mm. On uh, TV, the, I think it was last night, there was an expose about people stealing energy from each other. How is this possible and what are we doing to manage this that, you know, a factory here can steal energy from the factory next door? <laughs> well, unfortunately, uh, we yesterday, can't. <laughs> yesterday I was in a, a meetings until late at night. But I would think that um, if somebody steals from another, it's mm. a matter for the police. Mm. We should report such mm. uh, instances. Okay. Like people also uh, connecting illegally to the grid. Mm. Uh, we as members of the community where we stay, where people are involved in criminal activity, mm. because that's criminal mm. activity, it's our social responsibility to report them to the police. Mm. Mm. So all those uh, factors will mitigate if we as citizens take up the role and responsibilities that we have. We don't just turn a blind eye. Mm. The, the issue of energy theft is one that's very worrying because the sustainability of a lot of operators in the country is being impacted by what is called energy losses, which would be losses beyond the technical level and, and uh, acceptable benchmarks. So I suppose one could use this mm. platform to request assistance to nip mm. that problem in the bud, stealing by both big and small 
thieves. Mm. Is it is it symptomatic of a? Is it just thieving behaviour, or is it there's not enough energy, or that it's too expensive? That will cause people to behave in this way, Deputy DG. I don't know what the, the regulator's experience is, but the, I think, uh, and perhaps even ESCOM's experience, mm -hmm. but the, by and large, you, you, you find that there is an element of, of criminality, um, a big one. Um, there is also, um, uh, to some extent, you know, um, a, a, a gap in relation to, to um, access. And let me define that. What basically happens is that you'd find a, a one step a stand having more dwellings and as such needing to be you know connected more and more and those people might do it with the consent or without the consent of the of the stand owner mm -hmm. so you the, the problem varies from need and if where there is clear need identified you know we make adjustments in the policy to facilitate mm -hmm. that it happens and in some instances it's a matter for the police as the minister has indicated if i may add uh, to this from my experience as uh, being the Deputy Minister of uh, Public Enterprises, it's a challenge that we have to confront as a nation. There are areas in this country where people are not necessarily indigent or the poorest of the poor, but who do not pay their electricity bills. And in a number of areas where meter boxes, equipment, has been put in place, it gets vandalized because people simply don't want to pay. Mm -hmm. But if I can afford to drive an expensive car and I don't pay my electricity bill, that's a form of stealing. So there are also issues mm -hmm. that we as a nation have to address. Mm -hmm. To pay for the services that we utilize. Okay. From a policy instrument's point of view, government has got both the free basic electricity energy policy as well as, um, as a regulator, we've introduced the inclining block tariffs to mitigate the impact of high energy prices if indeed they are high. Therefore, to believe that people are stealing because of affordability is, is a hard sell to some of us. All right. Minister, there's 14% that don't have energy, as you said at the beginning. When, by when will they get energy? It's our challenge to ensure that the 14% who don't have access to electricity do indeed get electricity. There are a number of uh, factors that have slowed down the process mm. of reaching those. In certain provinces, it's also the terrain that we have. If you have a very mountainous terrain, outlying rural areas, but the responsibility of this government is to ensure that you should not be punished for staying in an outlying rural area. Uh, the people in rural areas should also be relieved from the responsibility of going to forage for wood in order to use it as a form of energy for cooking and uh, mm. all the other issues. So we have that responsibility. And it's a serious responsibility for the indigent and the poor of this country. It also speaks to one of the constitutional provisions of this country, the right to dignity. So government has to facilitate that all of our people, right. by easing their lives, could really enjoy this right to dignity. Okay, they're listening to you right now, those 14%, and they're trying to decide whether they're going to vote for you or not. So they need to know when they're going to have power. <laughs> In all honesty, I don't want to be accused of being a liar. Mm. I'm not going to say that uh, government will be able to reach the 14% in three months. It's a rollout program, as I said, by ESCOM, mm. by municipalities throughout the country. So it involves uh, our sister department. It also involves the Department of Energy to oversee that rollout process. It's an ongoing process. People can see that uh, there are areas that previously did not have electricity, but that are being electrified. So we are not going to make empty promises just because we are on the eve of the 7th of May. 
Responsible government mm. will say that there's mm. a rollout program. We are following that program okay. in order to do what we are able to achieve in 20 years, as we said earlier, what the previous apartheid government and the colonial government could not do in 100 years. So we are not going to lie to our people and say that in three months. We are working on it and we'll mm. achieve our targets. But before the next election. <laughs> before the next elections, <laughs> I can say we would have uh, significantly okay. have, uh, worked on that 14%. Right. Table number two, Temba. Uh, is it Kaula? Table number two, Temba Kaula. Honorable mm. Minister, there has been a rollout of CFL light bulbs, but there hasn't been any kind of exposure as to how to dispose them. Is there a plan for most of the densely populated areas? Thank you. Public okay. knowledge, uh, community involvement, and community education, it's an ongoing program of a multiplicity of uh, departments. Our Department of Energy, Department of Public Enterprises, DTI, mm. as we utilize the globes in order to save costs for the users, but the element that the gentleman also raises is important. So there are programs, there are com community mm. outreach programs that seek to educate the public on how best to utilize uh, energy, different forms of energy. Uh, what we said, energy saving, instead of boiling a full kettle, three cups for what you need. So within the remit of those programs, mm -hmm. there's also knowledge as to how to dispose of the globes that we have used. Okay. Table 26, this is something that comes up quite a bit, especially given some of the accidents that we've seen around the world. Uh, Orion Phillips, Table 26. Thank you, Minister, and thank you to the panel. In view of the safety issues that uh, go around nuclear power, I'd just like to know, what have the, have the, are these been factored into the new, new build program? The lessons of uh, Fukushima are of universal applications. All countries of the world have uh, sought to mitigate their safety measures, including Japan. So there's a sharing of information. In regard to the study visits that we conducted to a number of countries that I mentioned earlier, United States, Russia, France, mm -hmm. South Korea. That's an issue that uh, all countries take seriously. So as we move forward, mm -hmm. in order to realize the 9,600 megawatt capacity that's been allocated to our nuclear build program, that will form a mm -hmm. core part of our responsibility to ensure mm -hmm. the safety of this country and its people. All right, so we've got next there here, uh, Nuclear Energy Corporation of South Africa. I think you're over here somewhere. Is the CEO there? How safe is nuclear energy? I don't know if you could uh, just give us, because our viewers need, yes. you guys deal with it every day. Um, if you could uh, stand up, just identify yourself and give us some assurance about the safety of nuclear energy and how important a role it plays. Uh, Thanks for the question. Uh, uh, Minister, good morning. Good morning, sir. Um, nuclear is if you could just identify yourself first, please, thanks. Oh, my name is Pumzile Tselana, Chief Executive Officer of Nexa. Uh, your question is how safe is nuclear? I'll do a comparison. If you look at the chemical industry, you look at uh, coal-fired generation, and you look at the number of fatalities that you get, or injuries that you get in, in, in these areas, on a daily basis, you're getting a high number of uh, injuries occurring from uh, coal-fired generation, from mining through to operations, simply because of the volumes uh, th that are being moved around to get coal-fired generation, for example. 
and uh, the, the number of factories that exist. And if you look at nuclear, you would have uh, much, much fewer, almost uh, close to zero mm -hmm. in terms of uh, injuries. And uh, you get zero when you go to fatalities. And the one example that you can utilize uh, to see what I mean by this is the Fukushima Daiichi accident that occurred a few years ago where we had a, a refinery after the earthquake uh, that was on fire. And there were uh, injuries of tens of people. And if you look at uh, what happened to the nuclear plant, uh, the Fukushima Daiichi uh, units four, two, and three, uh, and you check how many injuries or even fatalities there were there, you'll see zero. Um, and that was a calamity that we remember because of the nuclear plant that, that uh, had the roof uh, coming off uh, that had uh, a lot of water uh, stopping the diesel generators functioning, etc., and the potential for radiation in the environment. Uh, we remember it as a nuclear incident. Meanwhile, it was an earthquake and a lot of water mm. that uh, uh, destroyed lives, property, and assets. So I would say, just using that example, that uh, nuclear is exceptionally safe. All right, but whilst you're still there, why is it then that some countries are pulling back from nuclear rather than developing it further? Well, um, of note, uh, countries such as Germany and Switzerland who uh, withdrew from the nuclear programs after Fukushima. Um, the reason the Germans are putting forward is uh, they've been scaling down uh, on their nuclear programs since 1986. In fact, that led us to, led South Africa to taking some, one of their technologies, PBMR, which they stopped in 1987-88, uh, uh, to develop further. We know that they've been hesitant at best in uh, taking their nuclear forward. The, the Fukushima Daiichi incident was a further a reason for them to scale back. I think they were looking for an, a reason to scale back and, and, and to actually push their renewable program. Okay. And, and uh, in terms of Switzerland, because of their uh, proximity to Germany in terms of their politics, uh, you find that they find mm -hmm. it easier Oh, more difficult <laughs> to, uh, to, to actually tell their populace that they should continue with uh, nuclear. All right, okay, so bottom line, nuclear is safe. But there's a, mm. another point that uh, we should perhaps share with regard to the German example. The fact of the matter is that they've moved back from the nuclear program and given that responsibility to France from which they import energy. Okay. All right. Uh, Jerry, uh, is that good? Good? Can't. Yeah. Dr. Jerry, table number 22. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Ms. Minister and your panel. Just a question on the clean fuels. I put it to you, sir, that uh, you have <laughs> thought about nuclear <laughs> and uh, sorry about uh, climate change and that it concerns you. In terms of clean fuels too, what are the plans, why the delays, and uh, what are the mechanisms that the investor who invests in clean fuels too will make sure that he recovers his, uh, his money? If you could please again, as the report has said, give us some, some sort of timelines around that. Thank you. Okay. It's been put to you. <laughs> uh, we are in court. <laughs> And it's been put to me that uh, Clean Fuels, it's a program that uh, we are busy with. And for greater details, I would ask uh, Ompi just to 
tell us where we are. Thanks, uh, Minister. Okay, if you could be very brief, because we're running out of yes. time. Yes. Yeah. Well, basically, where we we at now is uh, to um, finalise a cost recovery mechanism, which would um, outline how we're going to deal with the, you know, the the financing, if you like, of the of the program, because essentially what what is been asked mm -hmm. of the um, petroleum or the liquid fuels consumer is to pay for a retrofit program which will cost billions of rand and under the circumstances mm -hmm. government has to be circumspect about you know um, going into it without p uh, paying attention to all of these uh, these factors mm -hmm. you don't want to overburden you know the um, the user the the petroleum user um, unnecessarily under these circumstances so we need to find a, a happy mix in the cost recovery mechanism yeah. All right, before we disappear, because I think it's quite important, we've been talking about energy a lot, uh, we need to get a word from ESCOM. I think the chairman is here, uh, Mr. Zolatsozzi. Winter's on its way, um, and we are fearful. And I wonder if, and also your power plants, we've seen delays. Are we going to get through winter without blackouts? And when are our power plants going to uh, kick in? If you, could, if you could stand up, uh, you don't look like Mr. Tsotsi, but <laughs> anyway, <laughs> if you could identify yourself, I was about to say you look a bit pale today, but anyway. <laughs> Transformation comes in many forms. Uh, Andrew Ettinger, acting spokesman for Eskom, apologies for Mr. Tsotsi, who was mm. not able to be here this morning. Uh, heading into winter, certainly we're still busy with our maintenance program. Uh, we are cutting back naturally at this time of year as demand for electricity increases, but at this stage everything's under control. If we do have a problem in the winter, it will be for a short, sharp peak in the evening, so it's not the rolling blackout scenario we've seen in summer, so we certainly are in, in a good shape at this stage. The system is still tight, so we still desperately need the energy efficiency which has been talked about uh, through, through the breakfast. New plants coming along, Madupi will be producing power onto the grid by the end of this year, and then Kusile will be following Madupi. So for the next two years, we'll be tight, but the situation will, will gradually ease from the end of this year. And that's a quote. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you uh, for giving us an update there. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, so we're going to have to say thank you very much indeed to Energy Minister uh, Dikobe Ben Martins. Thank you very much, very much. for your time. Uh, the CEO at NERSA, uh, Pindele Baleni, thank you. And uh, Deputy DG at uh, the Department of Energy, Ompi Abane, thank you very much indeed for, for your time and uh, sharing your thoughts with us. And that's where we're going to leave it. Thank you all very much indeed and uh, for your tweets and uh, your interest and watching the program. And uh, we'll see you at the next one. I think we'll be chatting to uh, uh, Minister Malusi Gigaba. He's got an interesting project that he'd uh, like to share with us. So that's coming up at the next TNA. Have a great day, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that was great. Uh, Thank you very much to Peter and his panel.